to other light elements. Okay, so that was all the necessary physics, so it's not very much physics. So now we're going to go more into the mechanical, some electrical engineering side of things. Now, the vacuum chamber is the most important part, and in my opinion, one of the hardest pieces to build because it involves a lot of fairly low vacuum design. Uh, you have to use also magnetically transparent materials such as aluminum, copper, brass, things like that, because steel, even a lot of stainless steel has some ferromagnetic properties, and so that would cause eddy currents when you apply the magnet to it, and that would disrupt the field. It would become very uneven. You couldn't accelerate particles through it. Also, the chamber has to withstand very large forces without significantly deflecting, and that's because you have the very low pressure on the inside, atmospheric pressure on the outside. If the walls aren't thick enough, it just collapses like a soda can. And this is a bit annoying because you have to do this design with aluminum, whereas steel, like steel of even a small thickness, would be able to withstand this force easily, but doing it in aluminum is slightly trickier. So for vacuum chamber design, there are two main things you have to think about, and those are flight distance and mean free path. So the flight distance is the length of the spiral under ideal conditions, and that, as we said before, depends on the magnetic field and the voltage applied across the electrodes. So the voltage applied across the electrodes and the distance between the electrodes gives you the electric field, which is accelerating them. Now, on flight distance, there's a MATLAB simulation that I'm going to post to, this, to uh, the wiki, I guess, and then link to another website. I'll give you details on that at the last slide. Uh, by a MATLAB simulation for a magnetic field of 2.7 torr, 1,000 volts applied to the electrodes, you get a flight distance of about 300 meters. This is in a cyclotron chamber, which is about 8 centimeters in radius. So you'll have something on the order of that. So now you know what flight distance is, and uh, easy MATLAB or open office spreadsheet simulations will tell you what those are. You have to take into account the mean free path. Now, the mean free path is the length of the spiral under real conditions, and that depends almost exclusively on the vacuum pressure. And so that's because, as you can see on this slide, if you have a very, very low vacuum, almost a perfect vacuum, you only have a few air molecules inside your chamber. If you have a less than ideal vacuum, you, of course, have more air molecules. The problem is you have your electrons, your protons, your heavy ions that you're accelerating. If they encounter any one of these air molecules in your cyclotron chamber, they'll lose energy and go off course. And the combination of those two means that they won't hit your target if they hit a single air molecule. So you want to keep the vacuum as low as possible. Now, uh, well, here it's just kind of cartoony illustration of what mean free path is. So here are free paths. Here, the distance it travels before it hits something. Take the average of those. That's the mean free path. Now, um, there's a pretty straightforward equation for mean free path where, uh, well, kT over p sigma, with t is temperature in Kelvin, k is Boltzmann's constant in terms of joules per Kelvin, p is the pressure in Pascals, and sigma is the target's cross-sectional area in square meters. And that's basically, you have your atom. It kind of looks like this. What is the 2D projection of cross-section? Now, an interesting, oh, I think I have time for my interesting aside. So I'm, I'm a nuclear engineer in general, and cross-sections are used uh, fairly commonly in nuclear engineering. Uh, and the unit for cross-section in nuclear engineering is, well, it's one that makes a lot more sense than square meters. It's something called the barn, which is 10 to the minus 24 square centimeters. And the reason the unit was called that was, um, I think, back in the 40s, scientists, well, U.S. scientists, the Manhattan Project, were looking at the cross-section of uranium-235 and uranium-238. And the cross-section for uranium-238 was like, you know, 10 orders of magnitude larger than they expected it to be after they did their experiments. And they were like, wow, that's as big as a barn. So that's why 
the unit is called that, 10 to the minus 24, because it's really, really big compared to other things that are smaller. OK, so there's the mean free path equation again. So to minimize particle loss, you want your mean free path to be significantly greater than the flight distance, like an order of magnitude, two orders of magnitude would be ideal if you can get it. Though it's tricky to get it because it's expensive to get vacuum pumps that are good enough. So you want your vacuum pressure then to be around 1 or 0.1 pascals, which in atmosphere is 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 6. So that's, that's pretty low. You definitely can't build a vacuum pump like this. But uh, one of the wonderful things is that these show up on eBay fairly regularly. Like I just checked a few nights ago, and there are three that are suitable for this that cost under uh, 150, 200 US. So these can be bought. Uh, and they have to be bought, really. But that's the sort of thing you need to get the vacuum pressure low enough so your particles don't strike into air molecules. Now, uh, a bit more on the mechanical side of things. So as I said before, you have to use magnetically transparent materials, aluminum, copper, brass, things like that. Um, it's useful to... Uh, run some simulations to determine what the deflection is, because it's basically a circular plate that's fixed at the edges with a large pressure gradient distributed across the surface. So if you have access to SolidWorks or finite element software like ANSYS Adena, it's useful to run a sim like that. That'll also tell you how many bolt holes you need. I did a bolt pattern of, I guess, 16 for that radius. Just make sure you don't have any large stress concentrations in the material. Um, it works well to do an aluminum body and then brass bolt holes through it. Just from experience, you can't, aluminum screws don't work or exist at these pressures. Now, a uh, safety factor is another thing to continue, um, to consider rather. I, um, I feel like such a mechanical engineer talking about this here. But yeah, safety factor. It's defined as the maximum stress that the material can withstand divided by the maximum stress that the material will likely encounter during its service lifetime. And uh, in general, safety factors for things are like two or three. I was kind of a pansy, so my cyclotron had a safety factor of four, but it's, it's really your choice. You want the safety factor in place because, for example, what if you run your vacuum at a lot higher than it's supposed to? This will buy you some leeway so that your uh, your chamber doesn't crumple. Now, two types of aluminum that are good to be aware of. I'm not sure how much people know about these types of aluminum, but 6061 is uh, the cheapest type of aluminum. It's standard. It's very easy to machine. I use this for the body of the cyclotron because that can have thicker walls, so it's not under as significant stress. Top and bottom lids. It's better to use uh, aircraft grade aluminum, 7075. That's really, really annoying to machine, but you can make it smaller, so you'll be able to fit the cyclotron inside a tighter gap, which is useful, depending on the type of magnet you're able to buy or make. Now, just talking about those two parameters, Young's modulus and yield strength. Young's modulus is effectively the springiness of the material. It's like a spring constant. And the yield strength is the stress at which the material first starts to deform plastically.